when you meditate on the breath, we're focusing not only on the in and out breath, but also on the flow of breath energies in the different parts of the body. You try to get the in and out breath comfortable. Ask yourself what kind of rhythm would feel good right now. And experiment for a while until you find something that does feel good. But once you've got something that feels good, you try to maintain it. But at the same time, you have to keep an eye out for changes in the body. Because as the mind settles down, the breath energy needs in the body will change. So something that felt good five minutes ago may not feel quite so good right now. So you make more changes. The point is to find a spot in the body that you can make comfortable with the breath but without tensing up around it. So you can allow that sense of comfort to spread. And this is where you think about the breath energy flowing through the blood vessels, flowing through the nerves, out to the pores of the skin. So you can be bathed in a sense of well-being. And then you try to maintain that. And as you go through the day, if you notice there's any tension in your breathing, stop for a few minutes and allow it to relax. And once there's a sense of well-being again, allow it to spread. Anytime you're aware of the breath, you want this to be your first reaction. Try to make it comfortable. And this way you reclaim the breath. As the Buddha said, the, the breath is what fashions our experience of the body. This is how we experience the body from within. It's through the breath. And the way we breathe is going to have an impact both on the body and on the mind. And you're reclaiming the breath. Otherwise, your greed, aversion, delusion, fear, lust, these attitudes in the mind, these emotions in the mind, come and take over, and they take over the breath. They have their way of making you breathe so that you feel you've got to act on them. They hold the breath hostage. It's as if they were saying, as long as you don't give in to me, I'm going to hold on to the breath here, and I'm going to squeeze it and make it uncomfortable. And only when you give in will things be able to relax. And this has happened so long and for so many times that we believe them. We believe the threats. Therefore, remember that we can take control of the breath. We can weaken those things, those other voices in the mind. And here you take that sense of the mind divided against itself, and you actually turn it to your advantage. The divided mind or the divided self, especially if it's more unskillful habits, tend to be in charge, it can cause a lot of trouble trouble and cause a lot of suffering. You know something's not good for you, but you go for it anyhow. You try all different ways of making up your mind you're not going to go with it, and they seem to be for nothing, to the point where you lose confidence in yourself. This is why a lot of techniques for dealing with addictions talk about depending on the higher power. You've given up on yourself and you need somebody else to come and move in. Well, if yourself were a unitary thing, and it were in bad shape, yes, you would need help from outside. But as the Buddha points out, the, your sense of self is an activity, it's something you do. We're selfing all the time. And we have lots of different selves in there, lots of different voices in the mind. And although their interaction may have been unskillful in the past, it doesn't have to be that way. One of the advantages of meditating is that you can change the balance of power inside. So your wiser voices now have the breath on their side, and also an understanding of how the mind works. When the Buddha, Buddha taught meditation, he didn't teach just a concentration technique. He also taught right view, which involves understanding how your actions are what shape what you are the identity you take on, and the world that you assume based on your identity. 
and you understand that these things come around desires. So as you cultivate new, more skillful desires, it also then gives you the techniques for strengthening them. So that you become a new you. You can tap into your higher power. And the word your there is important because it is part of your mind. It's the potential is there. It's just that you've gotten so disappointed in yourself, you lack, lack confidence so much that you're not willing to admit that there's any strength inside you at all. But the potential for strength is there. And meditation and combined with right view helps you to take advantage of that potential so that this sense of a divide itself becomes your way out of unskillful minds, mindsets. And this, in other words, you realize that even though something unskillful is being said in the mind and it feels very strong, it's not the whole mind. It's not the only voice in there. There are other voices as well. And if they're strengthened with the right view and strengthened with the sense of well-being that comes from concentration, strengthened with mindfulness, the ability to remember things you've learned about what works and what doesn't work, then your potential for a higher power inside becomes a reality. So learn to work on these skills. Skills of getting focused, skills of allowing the comfortable breath energy to spread through the body, and also skillful ways of thinking about what's going on in the mind. Remembering that you're not alone when you're suddenly faced with a very strong desire. You've got your skills, and you've got other members of your committee that really do wish for your, your true well-being. This is one of the ironies of the divided mind or the divided self, that there's a part of the mind that doesn't really care. All it wants is instant gratification. And it's also developed a lack of imagination. A certain sense of discomfort arises in the body, and all you can think of, well, this is one way of getting, getting past it. Even though you know that over the long term it's going to be bad, you say, well, I'm going to get out now. Well, the meditation gives you an alternative. And when it becomes your default mode, that as soon as you're aware of the breath, you try to make the breath comfortable, there's a sense of well-being right there. You might ask yourself if something strongly addictive comes into the mind. Where do you feel discomfort? Where do you feel tension or tightness in what part of the body? Can you use the breath energy to go to that part of the body so that you don't have to feel controlled by that sense of discomfort? And can you can actually replace it with a sense of well-being? This way your desire for a long-term happiness begins to get more power begins to get more traction in the mind. And you realize that even though the problem is inside, the solution is inside as well. Simply learning how to take guidance from those who have dealt with similar problems. Because when the Buddha talks about the causes of suffering, craving, and the fact that suffering itself is a clinging, he's basically talking about addictions. And his way of dealing with addictions is break them down. Where's the feeling? Where's the perception? In other words, where's the image in your mind? How does the body feel? What chatter is going on in the mind? You can change these things. And you realize that when you change these things, the addiction is made up of only these things. So it's within your power to change them. Now, with the addiction, doesn't seem so monolithic. I saw a meditation book one time in Thailand. It had a drawing and had a very realistic picture of a tiger face. 
But then you looked at the body of the tiger and it was made out of folded paper. The point being that a lot of our desires and angers and fears come on really strong and very threatening. But behind the immediate threat, there's not that much. We've blown these things all out of proportion. So when you can take them apart, you begin to see the Buddha's analysis for suffering applies to all instances of suffering. We cling to our sense of the body, we cling to our feelings, our perceptions, our thought constructs, and our consciousness. And when these things turn on us, we're stuck with what we've clung to. But if we learn how to let go, and letting go means first fashioning more skillful versions of these things, more skillful perceptions, more skillful thoughts to give rise to feelings in the body that are a lot more pleasant, then you can get past the unskillful ones. You learn how to take them apart and assemble something good in their place. Because, you see, they were just constructs. They had gotten so habitual that they seemed to be really entrenched. But you can develop new habits simply by doing new things, often enough, which, so that your ability to stay with the breath, have a sense of well-being, a sense that you belong here, that the breath is yours. It becomes your new default mode. And this divided sense of self, you begin to realize, really can be turned to your advantage. So that even though the problem is inside, the solution is inside as well. And that's where your inner power that has been suppressed for so long has a chance to show itself. and to show that it really can work for your true well-being.